Hello, I hope you're having a great day and I'm super thankful that you have decided to watch this video. As I mentioned last time, I really hope that you will consider sharing uh, this video along with all our other videos. You know, we've been talking about in the youth room, probably mentioned this this morning as well, but we've been talking about in the youth room or in the youth class that anytime we send a link to a friend or we send a video to a friend, we're letting them have a door to Bible class or to worship literally right inside their home. It's as if we're sending them a door to our church building that they can walk through from their house and be here with us. Now, obviously, it's not quite the same thing, but we're giving people a way that they can be a part of our services while being at home. And I think that's a great blessing. And I think we need to be sure that we're taking full advantage of that opportunity. I don't know about you, but this is the time of year when I begin to miss football. The draft has just ended, and uh, you know I'm excited to see, okay, how, how are the players that we drafted going to turn out? Are they going to be the next superstars of the, of the NFL, or are they going to wash out? You know, who knows? You know, only time will tell. And it's an exciting time of year because of that. But what I really love about football, and the reason I love football, is because my grandfather started watching the Tennessee Titans play. And that's how I started watching football as well. I just started watching games with him. And, and that's some of my favorite memories, is, is watching the Titans play with my grandfather. But what I really love about sports and what I really appreciate is how they unite people. Not only did they unite me and my grandfather, which we had a great relationship beforehand, but they, they gave us even more to bond over, but it also united me and a lot of my friends. You see, sports helps us be united, especially football in this area. But what's even neater than that is the way that the gospel unites people. See, because the gospel has been uniting people since the beginning of the gospel. It's, it's, it's part of what the gospel does. It's part of what salvation does. It's part of what Christ accomplished on the cross. Is he united people. And I'm reminded of Acts chapter 10. When we're introduced to the character Cornelius, and he... Uh, is about to pray and he has a vision of an angel telling him to go get Peter. And so he sends some men to go get Peter. And while these men are on their way to get Peter, Peter falls into a trance. And that trance, he learns that all animals are now clean, that he can eat any meat that he wants to. And while he's pondering what this trance has taught him, these men from Cornelius come and they, they get him and the Holy Spirit whispers into his ear that it's okay to go. And so Peter does. He goes and he goes to Cornelius' house. And whenever he gets there, he says something very interesting in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. Let's look at what it is Peter says. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. See, Peter learned a whole lot more than just about animals in that trance. The trance also helped him see that the gospel is for all. Now, when Peter says that it was unlawful for him to go to a, another nation's, a member of another nation's house, or we would say probably an easier way of saying it, a Gentile's house, would be to, would not be against the law as in against God's word or against God's law, but rather it was against the application of the law. It was against the way that the Jews had chosen to live out God's law. It was a man rule, not a God rule. It was socially unacceptable to go to the house of a Gentile, but it was not necessarily against God's word. And so Peter, recognizing that God doesn't want any person called common or unclean, begins to preach the gospel to them. He begins to tell them the story of the gospel. And as this happens, the Holy Spirit descends onto the Gentiles. 
And so at this point, Peter's like, okay, who can keep these people from being baptized? You know, they need to become Christians. They need to have their sins washed away through baptism. And so Peter does. He goes, and they are baptized. But yet, whenever Peter gets back to Jerusalem, instead of rejoicing, the Jews criticize him. Look at what happens in Acts chapter 11, uh, verses 2 and 3. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? And they just started criticizing him. And so Peter's like, whoa, 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 you got to hear the story. And so Peter tells the story about how the Holy Spirit falls on them. And as he's explaining everything, they begin to understand. Chapter 11, verse 18 records, When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. It took a miracle. It took the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles to convince them that the gospel was for all. For us, it's a very common understanding. You know, we just we just know the gospel is for all. God wants all men to be saved, Jew, Gentile alike. Like God wants everyone to hear His gospel. We sing a song about this uh, called "The Gospel Is for All," and we sing about how where sin has gone must go His grace. The gospel is for all. But for the Jews, this was a very foreign idea. This was a very foreign concept. They were not used to this idea of the gospel being for all people. And so it took a great amount of convincing. There was a great division between Jew and Gentile that must be Destroyed, and, and Jesus, he does destroy that division. He does unite Jew and Gentile. Because unity is important to Jesus. Unity is in so important to Jesus that he died to create it. And while unity takes a lot of hard work on our part, it's worth pursuing. It's worth maintaining the unity that Jesus Christ established for us. We see that unity is worth, worth maintaining because of how important it is to Jesus. We see that it's important in Acts chapter 10. We see that it's also important in John chapter 17 and verse 11 when Jesus prays that you and I and that, that his disciples will be united as him and God are united. Unity is important. And even though it's going to take hard work, it's worth maintaining it's worth maintaining the unity that Jesus Christ created. Ephesians 2 verses 14 through 15 talk about how it is God created this unity through Jesus. This unity where, where God took the Jew and the Gentile and made the one. He made the Christian. It was not just applied to Jews and Gentiles in the first century. It's also been applied to us. And I think we've experienced something similar. Or at least I know I have. My time at Free Hardeman University, uh, I met a lot of different people. A lot of people I really had no business meeting other than uh, the fact that I went to school with them. And honestly, some of these people I probably wouldn't have been friends with if it had not been the fact that we were both Christians. If it had not been because of the impact that Christ had on my life. And on their life. See, Jesus creates unity among people. He creates a bond among people. He creates a family. And that's what makes the unity that Jesus creates so special. Even among one of my best friends. You know, we grew up in two completely different places. Uh, surrounded by completely different cultures. And yet have become great friends simply because of Jesus Christ. And that common bond, that common love we have because of that. See, in the first century, the Ephesians, they, they had a super hard time. They were going to have a super hard time maintaining unity because 
of the, the prejudice between Jew and Gentile. You know, the Jews saw all Gentiles. While all Gentiles were not like this, this is how the Jews saw them. They saw them as idol-worshiping heathens, or at least as heathens. They, they, they wanted nothing to do with them. And so they separated themselves socially and looked down on them. And I'm sure there were some Gentiles who wanted nothing to do with the Jews because they saw them as, as elitists, and they, they just wanted nothing to do with them. And if that wasn't hard enough to, to have unity in that situation, there is yet the problem that they were just simply humans. You see, because humans are kind of hard to put up with sometimes. You know, think about it. They, they had to deal with, with differing opinions. They had to deal with, with gossip and, and other sins. They had to deal with... Um, with annoyances that they might would have found in one another. There were just tons of different things that they had to put up with. Maintaining unity would have certainly have been a lot of hard work for the Ephesians. Now luckily for us, we don't have to, we don't have to work as hard to maintain unity because we don't have that first century division between Jew and Gentile. See, they were at a terrible disadvantage because of that. But for us, you know, that's that 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 division has pretty well been eliminated. But we still have divisions to put up with. We still have to to overcome certain things in order to have unity. We still have to overcome the little annoyances, the differing in opinions. We still have to overcome the the, the gossip, the lies, and all those things that try to tear us apart. But Paul gives us some, some wisdom as to how it is that we can overcome these things. God's word in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 helps us understand how to maintain the unity that Christ established. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul is urging us here to walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. You see, in the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul talks about our calling. He talks about how we have been, been saved, how we have been, been called from from death and our sin to life in Christ. And he talks about all the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. And now he's saying, look, walk in a way that shows appreciation for those blessings. Walk in a way that recognizes what Christ has done for you. And he describes what this looks like. He says that there are really five things, and I'm sure that this isn't an all-inclusive list, but this list does help us see how we can maintain unity. He says that we must walk in humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, and eagerly maintaining unity. This, that last point, eagerly maintaining unity, really seems to be the point that Paul is trying to get across to the Ephesians in these verses. He's trying to get across to them to maintain unity. And the rest of this list that we, that we read is all about ways that we can maintain unity. We must desire unity. It must be something that we are eager to maintain, that we are excited to maintain, that we that we want to have. We must remember that Christ created this unity for us, that Christ has given us the bond that we share, that Christ is the one who established our unity. It's simply our job to maintain this unity. And if we apply these traits to our life, we can more easily maintain the unity that has been created and established for us. If we're going to experience the reward of maintaining the unity that Christ
Christ has experienced. The first thing that we have to do is we have to bear with one another in love. We have to, in other words, put up with one another in words. That's literally what this is talking about, putting up with one another in, in love. I think the idea is, is that you can tolerate my annoyances because you love me. And I can toler tolerate your annoyances because I love you. And, and that's the idea here is that we have to choose to love one another. Because this type of love is certainly a choice. It's not necessarily always easy to choose to love one another. It's not always easy to choose to put up with one another because we love one another. But it's so important. Because in my opinion, what I truly believe is that whenever we choose to put up with one another in love, whenever we choose to love one another, that all of a sudden it's easier to be humble. It's easier to be gentle. And it's easier to be patient. Maintaining unity is easier whenever we start with the love that we have for one another. Maintaining unity is easier whenever we start with the love that we have with one another. Without love, these three principles, these three traits, humility, gentleness, and patience, are so much harder to apply to our life. We must choose love. Now it seems to me that that humility and gentleness are somewhat paired together because they, they fit together very well the, the idea and we're going to discuss that more in detail as we go on and it also seems like patience and putting up with one another in love are, are very similar ideas and so it seems as if Paul's kind of listing two very similar ideas back to back. So he's listing four things and then two of them are connected and then two of them are connected. But I really think while those two might be closely connected or closely or more closely connected, I think really they are all intertwined with one another. And I think we can see that as we move through this list. So let's look at these traits in more detail. Let's start with, with humility. Jay Lockhart uh, on his commentary on Ephesians, helps us understand uh, how important humility is by describing the opposite of humility, by describing pride. Let's look at what he says. Pride is the enemy of unity. Pride insists on its own way, even in matters of opinion and preference. Whenever we look at, at pride, it becomes quite clear how important humility is how important humility is in maintaining and keeping unity. See, because whenever I'm, I'm humble, I'm not focused on myself. I'm not focused on what I want. I'm not focused on what I need. And gentleness fits into this very well. Gentleness plays into this very well because gentleness is, is kind of like the application of humility. Gentleness is, is the idea of, of being willing to, to sacrifice one's own right for the betterment of the group or for the common good. And to do this without concern for reward. And so the, the idea is, is that it's almost like gentleness is the application of humility. Andrew Phillips, the minister at Graymere Church of Christ, uh, once explained the connection between humility and gentleness like this. While humility helps us recognize what God has done for us, gentleness helps us realize what we need to do for others. Gentleness is acting out on our humility. Jesus, er, gentleness is putting others before ourselves. But let's talk again about humility, recognizing what God has done for us. Because I think that's an important first step. Because once I recognize what God has done for me, and what he's done for you, I'm, I'm reminded of the doom I was just destined to face without God's help, without, without Christ. And I'm, whenever I'm reminded of what Christ has done for me, I'm reminded of the help that I need 
to get to heaven. And whenever I'm reminded of the help I need to get to heaven, I humbly have to admit that I need my brothers and sisters, that I need my church family. And I'm reminded of how valuable the church is to me. See, humility increases the value of the church. And whenever the value of the church is increased, the value of unity is increased as well. So it's so important to not only recognize how humility and gentleness are intertwined, but how important they are in maintaining unity. Humility and gentleness were characteristics of Christ. And they need to be characteristics of us if we are going to maintain unity. Patience is also a characteristic of, of Christ and of God. And whenever I'm reminded of the patience that, that God has shown me, I'm encouraged to be more patient with others. And I'm, I'm encouraged to, to show people the patience that I would want to be shown. Especially when I humbly remember that I probably have gotten on people's nerves too. I've probably needed multiple times to be shown some patience. So it's so, so important to remember how intertwined these things are and how vital they are in maintaining unity. My mom has said for years that that patience is a virtue, and a virtue never hurts you. And this is true, especially as we talk about uh, unity and maintaining unity. Especially the type of patience that's, that's being described here. Because this isn't talking about patience during trials or during hardships. This is talking very specifically, the word here in Greek is referring to showing patience when... Men, or when, when humans are getting on our nerves. See, this is specifically talking about dealing with people and being patient when dealing with people. This can certainly be a, a super difficult thing for us to do. It can be super difficult for us to, to be patient whenever people are just on our nerves and it just is like they are just bouncing on our nerves. Like they just are driving us crazy. But if we are eager to maintain unity, then we will show others patience. Then we will be long-suffering, even when people are on our very last nerve. Maintaining unity. Certainly difficult, but very much so possible. If we eagerly put up with one another in love, showing humility, gentleness, and patience. In Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, Paul provides important truths to help us be motivated to maintain unity. Let's read Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6 together. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. See, this is the reason we are to be united, because there is only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. It is upon these things and because of these things that we are to be united. There is but one plan of salvation for all people. There is but one church for all people. There is only one faith for, one, for all people. And there is only one God, one Lord, and Savior for all people. God has provided us with unity through His Son. Let us eagerly maintain it by bearing with one another in love, being patient, gentle and humble. Till we meet again, God bless you.